So let's uh, let's switch gears and let's talk a bit about uh, gear. Let's do it. <laughs> right. Well, that, we are nerds. I mean, we end up all just talking about gear, yeah, right. regardless, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, Convert AD Plus. I wanted to ask you because you've been uh, yeah. you've been on board with that since it since it arrived on the planet. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you approach, you know, mixing with it or mixing through it, or what or why you like it, or what yeah. uh, you know how you work with it. I think the starting point for me was the first converter that I was actually start listening post from the beginning of my mixes. So what I mean is, instead of capture my mixes and then master myself or like deal later with the post-production, I started with AD Plus to listen the conversion sound with the flexibility of AD Plus to just push a little harder or, but then listen as an instrument. So a make decision based on the actual sound of the converter, which is something that I recommend now regardless. You want to listen your converter. You don't want to just have surprise later. The good news is with AD+, there's no surprise, a good surprise, but then if you listen from the beginning, you might find yourself be creative with conversion. Right, so in the past, the advice for most people is you're, it's just a capture mechanism. It's try, you're trying to get the most accurate capture mechanism you can. Right. That's the end of the story. You listen often before you hit it, and then you listen right. after just to make sure it's not screwed up. But what you're saying is listen after it because you're using it as a tool, actually, as, exactly. maybe, as part, of the, part of the song. Maybe glue exactly. in a case, maybe yeah. whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, also, it's a relationship. So in my case, if I have a, if I'm summing, and I do parallel limiter, let's say, on my high percussions, then how this will translate if I'm also clipping the converter? So I do a lot of VCA automations where on my DAW, on purpose, I ride, so essentially I'm clipping the converter, but then going into the verse, I'm reducing maybe 3 dB, where not necessarily lowering my peak level, I'm reducing my RMS level, I'm giving yeah. more breathing space, right? My crest factor now go, go down. So I... Um, I love that. I love to be able to kind of like as an arrangement tool, push certain parts, give an emotion with everything coming in front of the mix, and then back down on on the builds or the pre-chorus. So those verses, you're probably already sitting at zero, but what you're doing is you're bringing up your average. Yeah. So you're still technically your peaks are at mm. the same place. Correct. But you're pushing it up, and to me that causes some, you know, maybe there's some. Anxiety in the yeah. listener, so it's it's creating yeah. emotion inside yeah. the listener, even though it's not getting louder. You know, yeah. it's actually yeah. the it's average. Is it's getting also louder. almost like a, a proximity effect that you have, where you take low level information, you bring it up into the mix, which is different than compression. If yeah. I do with comp compression, I'm, I'm achieving different things in a different way. I feel pushing with clipping on the converter. First of all, it's more organic. Uh, doesn't feel that I'm changing the envelope of my kick and snare. I feel that I'm changing a little proximity of the entire mix. And also I feel like everything else, if you do in a short part, so if you do 16 bars with everything's got in front, yep. and then you back off for like two, three dB, every time this happened, the song is like, wow, it's something happened at that moment. If you start the song and it's like beginning till end, is a square wave, yeah. and it's, it doesn't feel the same. It, the loudness that you, that you feel on that chorus if it's the same from 0 0.1 second to four minutes, you're gonna lose that feeling, if it yeah, makes sense. Right, you're wearing somebody out because it's always at the same level, and right. here you're creating something. I, I call it, we don't like symmetry in mixing. Correct. <laughs> right? oh, no, 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 asymmetry no, no. in mixing. I think I'm gonna stall this because it makes sense. That's the best explanation. Uh, I like also to use this uh, in, a, in a different way. I say, okay, when a singer tells the story, it's sitting on the edge of the stage to tell the story. There's no need of reverb delay because it's telling the story right in front of you. Now when the chorus hit, now she's moving in the middle of the stage and backup singer that come out. And now there's more power, more, more space, more reverb, more delay. That's a good way to look at it, I, yeah. I feel the same. So when I'm pushing, I'm, I'm giving space to the verse. Everything's breathing, more depth, more space. But then the chorus, everything's calm like. Yeah, that makes Louder. sense. There's an intimacy level in those yeah. verses, and then there's the, the mm -hmm. whole full production. Yeah. Awesome. So when you're going, when you're pushing that and you're clipping, are you using the clip guard? I do. I use the clip guard. 
It's also a psychological effect. For some reason, I like to see the doll without any blink of red. That would be like, you know what I mean? But then also I did some nerds testing and say, okay, but maybe the sound is different. It's not. It just sounds right. Uh, also, the reason why I like to do the, the clip guard, because if I'm regain, let's say, 2 dB, so hitting the, the DAW, and now I'm doing like minus 2 dB, for any type of reason, I want to do automations, yep. I cannot trust that level. Like, and, and yeah, so I do that. But at the same time, like I mentioned before, I might just touch um, on the peaks of kick and snare on the verses, but then when I hear the chorus, it just get like a little bit brick wall. Um, and I use way less, of course, or I don't use at all any type of in, in the box limiting at that point. When you are doing those, those rides, like the VCA rides, do you sometimes punch also, or you just automate the song from the start to finish? No, I do sometimes. So I do snap. Uh, if I do dance music, I usually we have like a, a build on the build up. I reduce, so I lower the level to 3 dB, and then I snap on the first kick of my chorus. So you have this effect of like snapping and get gradually lower and go back, back, and then pump, and then I hit and just I do that. Or sometimes I do rides on builder, but normally I do this little snap of like 1.5 dB, 2 dB, where I'm already like on zero. So yeah. my, that 2 dB is pushing literally 2 dB over. Yeah, yeah, got it. That's cool. And so the inputs on there, we have two different, in, two stereo inputs you can switch between, one yeah. and two. Do you ever use those? I do. I use, so I capture the, the, the mix down on one and two, and then on three and four, it's ready in case I want to reprocess a vocal without repatching, changing anything. I just simply go through a compressor, uh, a quality cue, and re-record the vocal back in, for example. I do that. Or if we're bringing, in some cases, we test different solutions. We like to have one extra input. All is ready without using a patch bay. I'm not a big, the biggest fan of patch bay. So I like to be a very clean, short cables. Everything goes you know, straight between gears. And quick. And right. quick. Yeah, because yeah. when you're making those decisions, you don't want to become no. an electrical engineer. You want to no. stay as an artist. Engineer. Also, that four or five seconds that you need to switch, you don't, we don't know anymore at the point. What I like before, after, I don't know. Right. So the liaison for that, and we can talk about the liaison, yeah. but the liaison was the first piece of gear that allowed me to really, like, half second, not even like a, I don't know, 50 milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, you stay, stay in the moment. Stay in the moment, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay, so you switch between those two. So one is for printing the whole mix and the other one is for spot yeah. fixes or like you said, maybe you process the, uh, an entire vocal an through outboard. Track. Correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Then what about the color circuits on there? You've got an optional transformer and then you've got an optional emphasis, two different yeah. circuits. Yeah. I love making a decision at the real beginning. So if, if a mix is a clean, very clean mix, and that there is space for tone and harmonics, I do at the beginning, again, be able to listen to the converter first. <clears throat> I'm making a decision. And most likely, more I'm pushing with transformer and less I'm gonna do compression and saturation on individual parts. So it's a decision that I recommend to make early on in the mix. And do you make a difference, uh, separate in your mind between transformer and emphasis? Do you play with yes, those two? Yes, I do, I do. Um, I find myself, if I go close to clipping, I might be careful not overly saturate uh, the clipping that I'm doing. So, but if I stay clean, I find myself that I can push more. So I can do a combination of both, a yeah. uh, little more, and then leave some edge room when I'm, when I'm capturing. If I want to capture louder, I might back off uh, the, the transformer. So if it makes sense. So yeah. I, it's almost like it's two different approach. I want to stay clean, give edge room, but I give like a tone and, and attitude the way mm -hmm. I capture, or I go clean by loud, by loud. So I, I make one of the two decisions usually. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then when you're, when you're pushing all that level in there, are you using the meter on the 80 plus or you use the meter in Studio One? I or? like to use the meter uh, almost like I want to see how far I'm pushing. So the right side of my eyes, Keep, when I'm pushing, I look and okay, now I'm zero, how, much, how far I'm going, how much I'm reducing uh, my dynamic range. Or your crest I, factor, your, my crest factor when it yeah. goes down, but also I kind of like to use it when, for a compound effect of 
kick plus snare plus hat plus clap. So if I'm close to clipping, now I'm mixing the drums, I want to see really quick if I'm adding a snare and I have two dB of snare and now I have another dB of clap or, or toms, how this is going to reflect as far as like the dynamic range left on, on, on the drums. So that's very useful to do that. Great. And do you use the zoom function at all to see that last 10 dB? I do sometimes. Okay. I do that too, yeah. Cool. All right. Mm. Uh, let's shift over to uh, 2 Bus Plus. Just talk about, really today, I just want to talk about color circuits briefly. I almost have, I think from day one at 2 Bus Plus, a go-to system, which is normally, I know we have 16, which is great. Yeah. And I like, but I like to kind of minimize on eight and I have an optional eight if I want to, get something out and have super clean uh, outside of paralimiter, as far, uh, outside of anything. But those eight, it's like nine and 10 is kick. The most of the time is mono. And then I jump to 13, 14 for my low percussion or the entire music. And then I'm going to explain a little bit the difference of the two. And then I'll do the, the 15, 16 is my high percussions. So Approach is like option number one. I go all the music in 1314. That's the harmonics. I want to get almost feel like the mid range bump that I'm getting from there. And almost I feel that I'm getting a mid range separation if I use a parallel limiter now for the high percussion, which is hats and crash and rides. Now my overhead get more like sparkle and a little bit of this extension on the top ends. This almost goes like automatically separate from, from the music. So Essentially, I have my two, two colors. Uh, the music, which is the harmonics, and the parallel limiter is the, my eye percussion. Then the kick, always, I keep the kick separated. Most of the time, mono. So I go back in my DAW, lower 6 dB, turn mono. So now I have a solid mono kick. I have the music with the harmonics, and now I have the eye percussion that I keep separate from the music with the parallel limiter. And when you're, when you're putting that to mono on, because you get a lot of stereo kick drum yeah, tracks, yeah, right? Yeah. So then you're, you're making that mono to sort of center it there. Yeah. And then when you bring that into your DAW, that's on one track or you're still... It's one track. You're just making it one track, not, yeah. not a stereo track. No, Great. exactly. Okay. Um, but still, there is something about the analog mono that is far superior than the DAW mono. Right. Uh, no matter what. Uh, and there's also like a phase response that feels everything gets together. I feel most of the dance music kicks are made by three kicks. There's a top kick, the medium, and the subby kick. The mono makes my life easier. It just feels like everything goes back in phase, even if it's out of phase. It's helping uh, the phase yeah, response. Pull, pull the whole thing, make it cohesive yeah, together. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, from that point on, I might have my insert on, on the 2 bus Plus, going to liaison and going case by case, maybe an SSL compressor, a dangerous compressor. Um, and then again, that insert is something that I might do later, but then my color is start from the real beginning. So the tone, I want to mix into the parallel limiter. Got it. There's a trick that I'd love to show you guys later with the parallel limiter, when I'm using the tone, not the compression. So mm. the parallel limiter, it gave me a sense of 1176 yeah. All bottom in, right? Compression. Then I find out if I use on my drum bus, and then I essentially do expansion in the box, and then part of the limiter, I'm expanding my drums on the way out, and I'm compressing. I do part of the limiter, almost like I am do even compression, but with the saturation and the tone, amazing toner on the upper mid range of the parallel limiter. I do that and it sounds incredible. Because okay. now I'm not squashing, now I'm not changing the envelope. Essentially, I'm expanding from one side, right. I'm compressing on the other side. Huh. At the end, it's almost equal, but with the tone of the parallel limiter. Great, okay, you definitely have to show us that. I yeah. want to check it out myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you ever find yourself using the polarity button on the liaison? Sometimes, uh, well, I use the, uh, the parallel all the time. Yeah. Uh, very useful. Uh, I, I think should, I should try to use the, the polarity more, actually. It, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I've been I've going around and not many people are using it, but, yeah. I, but when I demonstrate it, people are like, wow, that seems really cool. I should really... try that. It makes okay. sense. Yeah. All right. All right. So, uh, but you're using the parallel on the A lot. Horizon. A lot. Especially, I have gear that they don't have a parallel, so it's very useful yeah. to try. Sometimes even try, see, okay, it works. And then I do a little bit, almost use it as a gain stage opportunity. 
um, if I feel that I'm compressing, I'm not doing a lot of makeup gain, it's, it's an interesting relationship. It can be, yeah. again, borderline makeup gain, but also uh, parallel compression. Right, because you've got your dry signal and you're bringing in, yeah. so you, you're actually increasing level, of course, as you're bringing in the exactly. wet. Yeah, right. got it. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, I think we should, uh, we should play, play some with some music. toys and listen let's, to something. Let's yeah. do it. Okay.